Um, you know, I think I, what, what inevitably happened is I ran into a bunch of dead ends, right? I spotted an opportunity. I thought that opportunity was a good opportunity because I, I had a short sighted view on it. And then I'd go down that road and I may even make a bunch of money doing that thing, but inevitably it, it wouldn't lead anywhere. Mm. Right. And I, I did this 50 times as an affiliate. I did it, you know, another 20 times as a network. And at some point I was like, hold on, what am I doing here? Right. I'm not building enterprise value. I'm, I'm just chasing opportunities. And, and that takes a lot out of you. Every, you know, it's to tough. find a new opportunity, to ride that opportunity and to just know as soon as you maximize that opportunity, you got to be looking for the next one. You've got to do it all over again. Constantly going to zero. And... <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, we have Jason Akatif. The man is a legend in the performance marketing game. He started four successful companies, including the industry-leading A4D Performance Network. His team is now dominating the e-commerce space with innovative approaches to product identification, funnel building, and testing processes. His mission is to build sustainable, compliant, and long-term performance businesses. He builds for width instead of depth. He also appears to be focused on building a very enviable lifestyle with lots of travel, adventure, and champagne bottle popping. His talk at FBML, uh, Facebook Mastery Live, that we just had in Berlin, he was a great speaker. It was a huge hit titled, Some Simple Steps to Start Building $20,000 to $100,000 Campaigns. It's Easier Than You Think. Welcome to The Robust Marketer today, Jason. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Eric. Good. What, uh, so where are you calling from today? Uh, I'm here in uh, San Diego, California, San Diego County. We're about uh, 30 miles north of the city in a, in a city called Carlsbad, uh, ocean, right on the ocean, kind of a family bedroom community. Uh, love it up here. Nice. So what I like to start with is uh, the Joseph, Joseph Campbell idea of the hero's journey. So what is your uh, hero's journey as a marketer? What, what, what brought you to where you are today? Just in a nutshell, I'm sure you could go sure. on for a while. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of hundred steps there, but uh Essentially, I was selling franchises. I also was a speaker for Tony Robbins. I had some jobs that I had taken at certain points in time in, in order to uh, gain skills because it, at some point I always wanted to own my own business. Um, and I think this is something that, that a lot of people, when they go to get jobs, you know, they, they think about the money much rather than what skill set could I acquire uh, doing this thing that, that takes me to where I want to be in five to 10 years from now. What thing do I need to know? Uh, and then how can I get somebody to pay me in order to learn how to do that thing and, and become good at it? Uh, working for Tony Robbins was that for me. I wanted to learn how to sell from a stage and communicate well. And, and Tony taught me that. I wanted to understand operations and business and selling franchise licenses to fr potential franchisees and sub sandwich chains and whatnot kind of taught me that stuff. But at, um, you know, it kind of got laid off of my Blimpy International job and I actually bought a, a ebook online. Uh, it was called Search Engine Cloaker. And basically, uh, it came with an ebook and a forum. And, you know, I, I followed the ebook stuff. I, I think I paid $35 for the, for the access to the, the forum, you know, one time cost and the ebook. Um, Followed some of the ebook stuff, probably made $50 back using the strategies outlined inside of the ebook as I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm. Um, and it, it was good strategies. I just didn't understand what I was doing. And a lot of times, you know, people can give you great information, but it takes you a long time in order to get the skill sets up to be able to utilize that. Uh, even to this day, I still buy information based products because. There's nuggets inside of those things that, you know, we can put to a 50 or $100 million company, you know, that they, they actually, some of the stuff in there works. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of hype around it a lot of times, but that led me to get involved in a forum. Uh, and really the forum is what allowed me to, you know, uh, understand because I keep in mind, I was a guy out of my house. I didn't know anybody that did this. There was no stack that monies. There was no, Wicked fires. There was none of that stuff back in the day. There was no education. There was no tracking platforms. There was none of that stuff. This is back about 12, 13 years ago. Um, so, you know, I, it was like, is this thing even real? Right? It's <laughs> affiliate marketing, you know, whatever. 
you know, and then I was in this forum and then reading the case studies and list, watching the other people talk and saying what they were doing was enough to keep me going inside of that inside of that thing to go, OK, I think this is real. Like I'm actually talking to these three or four people in this forum and they're saying this thing is real. And, you know, over a long time, I, I uh, you know, the, basically I spent a year trying to learn the business, working almost 14 to 17 hours a day, seven days wow. a week. You know, just glued to my computer. I, I I made that first you know dollar or dollar fifty or whatever. I think it was a dollar thirty six cents I got from Google, and I was like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. How long from when you got the ebook to you made your first dollar? Uh, it wasn't long. Couple you know, months. I, I I think uh, no, it wasn't even that because it was built with uh, AdSense. Okay. So I put AdSense on my site. I probably clicked the ad myself, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, I got a, there was, I think it was a dollar 36. Yep. And then I got a check from Google and I still remember I got that check and I was like, is this even real? Like I still Can didn't catch this. At that yeah. point. Um, and then I took it to the bank and I thought there, it's just going to get rejected. It's still fake. Right. And then they took it and I just remember hitting refresh on my account over three days cause I thought it was going to bounce cause it still wasn't real. And then that money was in there and I was like, oh, okay, I get it. This is real. Yeah. I didn't talk to anybody. Somebody sent me some money. I was like, this is the coolest shit in the world. <laughs> right? yeah. um, then there was another step after that that I, you know, was I, I did my thing for like two, three years. And then I heard about Affiliate Summit and I went to Affiliate Summit. And at that point, there was probably 30 booths at Affiliate Summit, but there was probably 500 people there. And then that made it even more real and more opportunity for me, right? Because it was like, oh, I went from this this ebook thing to, you know, maybe getting a couple of dollars to, wow, there's a whole industry actually around this. There's a bunch of people that are doing this stuff. There's real people involved. Like this is a real business. Fun people. Fun people. Great people. <laughs> yeah. Um, smart people, entrepreneurial yeah. people, hustlers, like people like myself, right? Um, and from that point forward, I was like, okay. I'm in. So I was uh, I was an affiliate myself for about four and a half years full time. Uh, I did Black Hat SEO, which was essentially figure out Google's algorithms, Bing's algorithms, and understand how I could spam the search engines to get my listings uh, up in, in those. And I learned to write some code and stuff like that. Oh, so after uh, after that year of teaching myself to code and stuff like that, I actually made a connection with a friend. Still had made no money. I think I made twenty six thousand dollars that year, okay. and most of it was in an unemployment uh, <laughs> insurance benefits. Um, and then a friend that I had met through a forum came along and said, "Hey, I've got this thing I've figured out. I'm I'm doing it with a macro, but if we could do it much larger at scale, I think we could make much more money." So. Then I took my PHP knowledge that I had been training myself to do, and I automated all that. And then that next month, I made about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in a single month. Wow! Yeah, On an got, exploit that you'd found. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was back then. It was like posting trackback links to a blogger blog was essentially the gist. Okay. Right? Blogger blog was a PR ten blog that ranked, you know, that Google and Bing recognized, and then you know, uh, trackback links. So we get 10,000 trackback links from different blogs and that would give enough domain weight to that blog for any of you that know SEO to raise that up in the search engines. Um, so that was kind of my first big win. I, it, you know, it also ended up in, uh, I got to learn how shady the industry was because I generated all these sales through Commission Junction uh, and they waited until the very last day and then the merchant disputed the sales and I actually never got paid on that money. Hmm. Right? But welcome to affiliate marketing. <laughs> yeah, crash course early on. Yeah, if it's too good to be true, then it probably is, right? Like, yeah, always. I still here with like Avazu and stuff like that, these guys that go run these CPI campaigns and then they're just like, yeah, we're not gonna pay you. So have a nice day. Yeah, you know? with apps so, especially, that's something that's happening all over the place. Yeah, so super, super dicey on that front. Um, so. Uh, kind of that that happened right around year two. Then um, I got I started to figure out more opportunities than I could write code for. So then I started developing what I called uh, kind of project partners. 
So I'd find a guy that knew how to code and I'd be like, okay, I figured out this opportunity, write this code, I'll supply proxies or I'll do whatever in order to make that thing go. And I wound up with about seven of these project partners. Um, but then I was on so many different affiliate platforms and then I had to have seven accounts on each affiliate platform for each of the partners that I was like, all right, let me get a tracking platform. And that's when ad, what used to be ads for dough kind of got formed. Okay. Um, uh, so that I could just manage my project partners. But at that time I was, uh, you know, what is stack that money now it used to be a forum called wicked fire. Uh, I was a moderator on that forum and I had helped a lot of people over a, a long period of time. And then some people found out I had a network platform and the next thing, you know, uh, you know, I had 2000 affiliates sign up from wicked wow. fire to, to be part of our network. I didn't know what I was doing. It was me working out of my house with no employees. I had all these affiliates and then I had to find merchants and you know, yawn and on and on. Um, we, uh, way back when, so everybody knows kind of black hat diet stuff today. So if you go back to like 08, that all started with Acai. I and remember. Landers and Newslanders and stuff yeah. like that. So we were doing- Farticles uh, and flogs. Yeah, particles yeah. and blogs. We were doing uh, ten to fourteen thousand trials a day on acai wow. and colon cleanse. We were doing another seven thousand trials a day on uh, bizop and stuff like that. We were doing some grant trials, and I mean, just massive. It, it spawned into this thing that did some massive volume. Uh, you know, really all scammy stuff that you know didn't provide any value to customers. Abused a lot of customers, but at that time, I, I didn't. I didn't really understand. It was just money to me. Um, it's a game, right? Yeah. It's just, yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and all this, uh, you know, and I, at some point I kind of felt like, you know, I feel like what I'm not doing isn't right, and there was a bunch of stuff that started to show up in the news, and, you know, it, it got harder and harder to sleep with myself. And then eventually, uh, a lot of you probably know, we got sued by the Federal Trade Commission um, we weren't actually running the traffic and we didn't own the offers, but it, you know, as for though at that time was kind of in between, it was the conduit or the pipe, yep. uh, that went in between. Uh, so, uh, the FTC, the federal trade commission went and did a sweep of all the networks, uh, that were involved in this business, click booth, Copiac, uh, ourselves, uh, convert to media. They investigated. But I was at Never Blue at that time, and they had oh. they they did a quite a. They were very cognizant of that, and they sort of skirted it, and and they stayed on the outside. They didn't make the big money on it, but they yep. didn't uh, didn't get involved in the uh, the issues. And I remember exactly uh, when that was going down. It was a very interesting time. Yeah. Um, so that happened, and you know, they basically told us we could run international. You know, as long as they it didn't affect them it didn't come back to them mm. you know we could run in international countries all that neutral stuff still but i i decided at that point like i wanted to reinvent the biz i wanted to pivot and reinvent the business um and you know that was a hard thing we went from about thirty thousand a day to thirty five thousand a day gross profit on average down to uh, 1.4 yeah. and we had thirty five thousand dollars in overhead a day uh, you know, between our New York office and our San Diego office. Um, so, you know, inevitably uh, a lot of the salespeople left because they only knew how to sell diet. They're yep. you know, one trick pony type people. They're, they're still selling diet to this day. I'm obviously friends with a lot of them, but totally one trick ponies. They don't really know how to do anything else. So a lot of the company just left on its own to, you know, go sell diet somewhere else. Um, a lot of them work at ad exchange and, uh, I forget there's a C5 and stuff okay. like that. I mean, still in, still in that world. So then at that point we went down the road to Legion and we started building a lot of our own portals. We were going to, you know, that was going to be our thing. So we built solar, we built refinance, we built debt, we built in on and on and on. And we, we invested a lot of money and time in that over a two year period. And it, you know, it paid the bills, but we kept running into this kind of ceiling. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the, the ceiling was quality and caps, like everything had quality and everything had caps and you, you really couldn't scale the business. You take the same lead, sell it to the same lead to three floors and one would say it's amazing and the others would say it's crap, right? Um, so there was no consistency in understanding uh, the business and very, very difficult to sell, to scale. 
And for me, I want to build a billion dollar company, a billion dollar plus a year company in revenue. And I was just like, I don't see how to get there unless we own a sales call floor in the Legion space. And mm-hmm. me, I, I have zero interest in actually running a, a sales call floor. So we actually shut down almost all those portals except one, which is our, our cover my funeral offer. Uh, which is in the UK, it's funeral insurance. It's been good for us for the last, I don't know, three or four years. We have one buyer on the back end and it it's, works fairly well. So we cool. left, left that live, but we shut everything else down. And then, you know, at that point, I kind of stood, ba- stepped back and I said, okay, I want to build a business of over a billion a year in revenue. I wanted, and, and I started to lay out a framework of what I wanted my life to look like what I wanted A for D to become in five to 10 years from now. That, you know, I want to make sure that we control everything from beginning to end. I want it to be our product or our lead or our whatever. I want it to, uh, I want to be 1% of the total market share in order for us, maximum in order for us to achieve our goals. And I started to build this list of business objectives. And then at that point, I started to go out and look at what different business models potentially meets all these business objectives that I have that, but, uh, for where we want A4D to go. Um, and then uh, at some point I identified e-commerce. So now we're doing physical, what I call demonstrable physical goods uh, in the e-commerce space. Uh, we import, we brand, we do brand development for all of it and then yeah, sell to direct to consumer. So a lot of, um, we still have the, the A4D network business, which is super strong, growing all the time. I've got a great team you know, in charge of that side. Uh, we've got our own internal media buying division. i got a great leader in that division, and, and that's building. I think we've got 10 or 12 people on that team wow. now. And then we have a product division, which I went and hired uh, one of the VPs out of Lego to come in and build the product division for us. So. You know the the key for this stuff for me has been just finding the great leaders that can that can uh, you know drive innovation, drive uh, operations uh, for for those different divisions, and that's that's kind of where we're at today. Um, you know, my goal is to have a thousand SKUs selling in a four year time frame. Wow! Uh, and what are you at now? What's that? What are you at now? We're about twenty five right now. Twenty five SKUs. So you know we've got all the models figured out. So now we're starting to build automation. Now we're starting to build modeling and automation. We're bringing data scientists in, and you know heading down that road. So so this is really interesting. That that moment. Had you always had those sort of periods in your life where you gathered yourself and thought, okay, what do I actually like? How do I want to construct my life? How do I want to construct a business? What are my end goals? I feel like this is something. In the whole world right now, that's missing, and definitely in the affiliate marketing space, uh, where people are, you know, maybe short-term thinkers. Uh, mm-hmm. But actually thinking about what you want out of life, in professionally and personally, is something that I right. think people don't take the time for. Is that something you'd always done, or was that like a come to God sort of moment uh, when you did it? And when in your life did you do it? Um, you know, I think I what what inevitably happened is I ran into a bunch of dead ends, right? I spotted an opportunity. I thought that opportunity was a good opportunity because I, I had a short-sighted view on it. And then yeah, w- I'd go down that road and I may even make a bunch of money doing that thing, but inevitably it, it wouldn't lead anywhere, mm. right? And I, I did this 50 times as an affiliate. I did it you know, another 20 times as a network. And at some point I was like, hold on. What am I doing here, right? I'm not building enterprise value. I'm I'm just chasing opportunities, and and that takes a lot out of you. Every you know, you to find a new opportunity, to ride that opportunity, and to just know as soon as you maximize that opportunity, you got to be looking for the next one. You've got to do it all over again, constantly going to zero, and that's great if you're a, a solopreneur that's you know you've got a bunch of savings and you can weather those storms. That's that's great, right? But I, you know, the company that we're going to build is probably going to be 400 to 500 people and you can't have that inconsistency and build, you know, a company with that level of people. It it just costs too much money. It'll be $5 million a month. It'll cost us to operate probably. So you need to, you know, on, on that list of business priorities, it's like needs to be stable, needs to be compliant and Facebook happy with it. Need right. And it needs to go down and tick all these boxes on this list for it to be the right thing in order to solve that problem. But 
I, you know, I think part of it comes with age. You know, I was, uh, was talking to this guy that's uh, CEO at a, at a $200 million company the other day. And he's like, you know, at 20, you just want to get money and you want what the 30 year olds have. And when you're 30, you know, you you kind of start thinking about family and stuff like that. And so you start to think about more stability. And then when you turn in your 40s, you know, you start to think, how do I give back? Right. How do I coach and educate and train? And then as you get into your 50s and 60s, you really start to think about legacy. Like, how am I going to be remembered in this world? Am I going to be remembered as the guy with the cool cars? Right. Or what am I creating from a legacy perspective whether it's for my family, whether it's for the world to make the world a better place, whether it's, you know, what am I creating? And, uh, you know, I think part of it comes comes with age. You know, when you're when you're 20 years old and you're in your 20s, it's just like, I just need to get some money. You know, I, I need the watch. I need the car. Yeah. You know, yeah. and as people get older, that that stuff doesn't matter nearly as much, you know. But it's it's just that pivot too of really th- trying to be conscious of yeah of, of of what you're doing at at all stages. This is something I'm running into right now with with iStack Training for sure. That you know we're building out this plan to to really build something, not just go course to course or live event to live event because that's right. uh, it, it takes a lot out of you. Uh, and so being able to build something that's sort of systematized is definitely on on my priority list. And I think it's something that everyone's really starting to think about. One thing that uh, we'll just jump into this because you you mentioned it and I I, th- I see an interesting parallel is right now you're doing what you've already done in the affiliate marketing space, which is systematizing and building this this sort of like deep base uh, in e-commerce. And this is right now when a lot of people are jumping over to e-commerce and they're thinking about the quick hit. They're setting up their Shopify, their Alibaba, their, their drop shipping stores. And, and then, you, but you've already been in the space for five years and you're already moving to that like next level kind of big thing. So what do you think people need to think about who are thinking of jumping into e-commerce right now as someone who has sort of built this sort of more stable organization around it? What are some of the key things that you'd point out to new people wanting to just from scratch, they've been in affiliate marketing maybe, and they want to jump into e-commerce. What would you suggest? Um, I, I would actually suggest make the same suggestion to anybody about anything that they want to get involved with. And that suggestion is ask yourself, where do you want to be in five years, right? Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Because if you just want to make a million dollars a year, you can find opportunities all the time to make a million dollars a year. I mean, it's it's not a hard thing it's in our world to do. I mean, it's like, okay, let me go on which ads work. Let me go find the e-commerce products like the black mask and whatever else is hot, and, you know, the hair curlers and this and that. And let me go run it and hit it hard until it blows up. And then I'll go find the next one, right? Like there, there's a very different perspective for that, right? So there's that. And then there is, okay, how do I do that in a sustainable fashion so I don't go to zero, but I still only want to make a million dollars a year and I'm not looking for an exit. Or you've got another group of people that are like, okay, so if you look at the startup world, they're like, I don't want to make any money at all. I'm just looking for an exit. And then you've got, you know, kind of my perspective on things is like, I want every product that we come out with to be profitable from the front end. I want to make money on every product from the front end and I want a massive exit at the end, right? So it it really depends on what time horizons are, what goals are of the individual. I I have people ask me for advice all the time. They're like, well, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, well, what is your goals? Where do you want to be in? Who do you want to become in five years? Who do you want your business to become in five years? Because it's going to totally be different. I take almost all the cash that our business throws off and I reinvest it back into the business. Number one, because I don't want to pay taxes. Number two, I've got plenty of money that I don't, you know, I pay myself a a living wage. Um, So I take all that money and I put it back into the business because my ultimate goal is to sell something for billions of dollars, right? And if it's that I need to make as much money as possible is my goal. That's totally not in alignment with I want to exit a company for the highest value in the shortest amount of time as possible. They're, They're different goals and they're different objectives. So I would tell uh, I would tell somebody on the e-commerce side, you know, if you want to make money, go on which ads work, find the stuff that's working, plug and chug, stick it in Shopify, and run it hard, and you know, until it doesn't work anymore, or yep. Facebook starts to ban it. Find right. little ways to innovate within that space, within you know, to innovate on your competitors who may be doing the same right. thing. Yep. 
uh, and just run Some it. Kind of affiliate mentality, right? I mean, our our stuff, like what we're doing is we're identifying products, but then we're branding them, we're iterating on those products that make them unique to us. We're building packaging, we're building boxes, we're building a customer experience and a customer journey around that thing. I mean, we're we're a product company much more than an e-commerce company. My goal is to be in retail by Q4 of next year. Um, you know, so we're building a product company. We're, we're going about things a bit differently. So again, it depends on what the goal is yeah. and, and where somebody where somebody wants to go with it. Have you ever run an infomercial? Are, do infomercials still work for, for products? Do. I bet they, they do. do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, you know, TV and radio are interesting things because their brand, there's brand awareness creation. So you've got like, you know, if you look at Telebrands, Telebrands is the largest infomercial company. Okay. You know, they were OxyClean and a bunch of other stuff like that. You know, back in the 80s, they found out the opportunity with remnant inventory to do infomercials to make money. But now, from what I hear, they're kind of just breaking even, making a tiny bit of money on TV, but they're creating brand awareness. And then they make 80 or 90 percent of their money now in retail because they, they get all that brand awareness for essentially free money uh, on TV. And then they put it into retail and then people buy it in retail. What, what I think uh, you know, we forget as online marketers, 90% of all consumer products are still sold through the retail channel. 10% is only sold online. That's crazy. So you know, if you go run an, a product hard and you get brand exposure, you build a brand and then you show somebody a product, they're gonna walk into a store asking for that product somewhere. So if you're not uh, filling that need, somebody else is going to. We had this happen actually in, um, in Brazil. You know, we were running a product back in the day called Caraluma and we did massive amount of sales. It was a weight loss product in Brazil. Uh, but it created a whole uh, Caraluma craze inside of Brazil, which it was flying off the shelves in all the stores because we were driving this demand through our advertising uh, for this product. So the same thing happens in the e-com world. If you go, you know, I guarantee you, if you're running a black mass product, it, those things are probably selling tremendously well at Sephora and all that other stuff. And if you're not creating a brand, you're missing all that lost opportunity uh, through that stuff. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective. You don't think of that. You get, you, you, you know, we sort of have our, uh, our head so firmly in the online space and there's so much opportunity within the online space, but to think it's right. only 10% of, of commerce is growing. Right. I'm sure it's growing all the time, but at the same time, the when, time, when you can get into stores like that, that's definitely the way to go. And that's your goal. You say Q4 this year, Q4 next year, next year, you know, I'd like to have one or two SKUs in, in stores, uh, by Q4 of next year, Christmas uh, season. What product that you have, are you like that you like the best? Um, I don't know. I'm not, you're not that into it. <laughs> no. I'm a data driven guy. I, yeah. I mean, I like, I like the stuff that sells consistently. I, I like the, uh, you know, one, one of the things for us is like, I, I don't want to fall in love with products, right? Like I want a yeah. thousand SKUs that are all performing at a, at a small level. I don't want to blow anything up, right? If you blow it up, you burn out the ads, you burn out the audience and that, that there's no longevity there. So I want, I'm a model guy, so you know whatever the product might be, I'll does it fit in the model? We we have a what's called a stage gate process where we run an initial test, we look at initial metrics, and we decide to move to stage two, we decide to move to stage three, and we progress everything along in a model based fashion like that. Um, you know, and then we have some some key metrics on how we identify. What what potential sales factors that are you know drive uh, direct response products online, and you know my next step there is like we've got a whole list of that stuff, and then we work within verticals and customer bases, uh, and then we we have customer based brands, and then we have product lines uh, under brands under the customer based brands, okay. and. So then now we're going to go hire uh, what's called uh, product buyers uh, out of probably like one of our demographics is kind of the Cabela's Home Depot world. So we're going to go out and hire the people uh, that essentially decide what products go on the shelf of Lowe's, what products go on the shelf of Home Depot, what products go on the shelves of Cabela's. We're going to hire some of those people in to start being our product identifiers mm -hmm. and say, hey, these are some of the stuff that work well in the online world. These are the weight, the sizes that we can ship effectively. This is the costs. This is what our cost to consumers need to look like. The checklist go, again. 
exactly. Go identify, you know, a hundred SKUs that fall under this. We'll put them through a review session. Then we'll go run some test data, right? And and move, march along in in that fashion. I mean, one of the one of the smartest things that I feel I did on the on the uh, product side of stuff is I went and hired somebody out of Lego and Upper Deck and No Fear Clothing and you know that's done nothing except retail their whole life physical because goods. physical goods yeah retail physical goods specifically she had zero e-commerce experience mm. um, but she understood how all the supply chain the safety testing the uh, you know how to deal with the shippers how to deal with uh, the vendors and negotiate how to get terms out of China. She already knew how to do all that stuff. She just didn't understand the e-commerce component of it. But on the other side, I went and hired a guy that uh, had a 20 year background in direct response marketing and um, you know ran his own agency and stuff like that. And I brought him in in order to craft the funnels and build the ads and get all, you know, all the initial frameworks to stuff off the ground. So, you know, it's definitely about, uh, you know, as, as you progress and as you ha get money, uh, you know, how do you hire the good people to, to do the stuff uh, that are, are better than it, you at, you know, making stuff happen. So you're not constantly trying to learn how to do it. Yeah. Who was your, I want to ask the question, who was your, because you talked a lot about hiring in your speech, uh, uh -huh. about who, uh, in your FBML speech, you talked, sure. I've recently written a blog post about it. Who was your first hire? Uh, there was a guy named Tyler Weaver. I kind of hired to just be administer the network. He had a, a programming background. Oh, that's my phone. Okay, no uh, hold on. Let me decline that. Um, so uh, a guy named Tyler Weaver. My second hire was a guy named Brandon Moore. He works. He runs the network over at C5. Um, Brandon I hired as an affiliate manager uh Tyler, I hired just kind of as a operational person to set up campaigns and, you know, run some traffic and stuff like that. I, I honestly did, had no idea what I was doing. Mm. Um, you know, I, I was at a disadvantage in the sense that, you know, I didn't go to school for an MBA. I never worked at another real corporation. Most of my jobs, as I said, I took in order to acquire skill sets. Uh, I didn't understand that one of the skill sets that I needed to be great at was operations or at least have an appreciation for. So uh, if you've read my blog or, or were at the talk, um, you know, it's very much about uh, I know, understand operations now and how important it is. Right. Before all I saw was a cost center, but it does such amazing things for for the business. You can go read my blog at jasonakatif.com. Um, you know, if you want to take a look at that, that post and why that operations person in my, my belief is if you're an affiliate is the first person you should hire, right? Because they're the ones that are going to be able to extract all the intelligence that you don't know that you don't know that you just do automatically because you've learned over the years, uh, whether that's managing servers or building creatives or writing copy or running campaigns or doing business development with networks and collecting money and do right they're going to take all that extract all that stuff out of your head and turn it into an actual business that you can hire and train into um, most people i see you know they they go and they hire a media buyer because they think a media buyer is going to make them money and you know inevitably what you're going to wind up with is you're going to wind up with yourself with a bunch of helpers doing stuff and then your life is going to be miserable because uh you know oftentimes people talk about a lifestyle business um you know and, and i think that's kind of funny because you know the most people that i know that work a lifestyle business work their asses you know, off 12 hours yeah. or 15 <laughs> hours a day right like for me I'm like, I have a lifestyle business. I, I mean, I've traveled 120 days probably in the last year uh, to the most amazing locations on the world. And I've got a team here that, that runs and the company continues to grow. We continue to hire, continue to build. And I get to think of high level vision and I'm not in operations and I'm not in the, the tactics and I'm not in the technical unless somebody comes to me from one of my management level and said, we need some help with this. I, I, I love to get involved. But it's not necessary in order for the business to continue to run and grow. And that seems to be one of your real strengths too. Um, is is that and, and one of your roles as the CEO being able to you know support support this amazing lifestyle, but then also being able to dive in when you have to, like because you still have those technical chops to some extent. 
you've been you've done every part of the business. So right. I, I remember when you at FBML, you you made the comment that you were super excited to go home and start a, a, a messenger uh, marketing campaign, essentially, yep. and that you would then talk to your operations and say, okay, here's my vision for this, because you, you sort of know you can see how it would work. So that right. seems like a seems like a really good skill to have to be able to dive in whenever needed. Definitely. So, I mean, I I think people. You know, I, I watch Carol, who runs my product department. You know, she doesn't know e-commerce at all, and I watch her struggle to try and understand, to to make sense of why anything is happening, why did traffic stop, or why are conversions bad today? Like, she she doesn't understand the non-consistency there, and she's learning and growing in that aspect, and she's understanding what metrics to monitor, but she's not able to get in and actually help do the thing, mm. right? Like, she she doesn't have that ability on that front yet. Um, but she's amazing at, at all this other stuff. But, you know, I, I think one another thing that as people get older, um, and I'm 42 now, uh, as, as I've gotten older, in my 20s, I thought I could do everything, right? Anything that needed to be done, I was like, all right, I'll go read the books and I'll go understand the thing and I'll go uh, do whatever. And, and, and you probably could. Is the and question probably, is, should you have? <laughs> it, it, well, exactly. Well, and, and really, you can't do it all, right? Yeah. So... You know, kind of as you move into your 30s, you're like, okay, here's what I'm good at. I could do that other stuff. And I know I, I, you know, it's like an ego thing, right? As an entrepreneur, it's like, I could do that other stuff, but uh, I probably should not, or I'll try it, but then it kind of falls. And at some point I, I pivoted and I was like, I shouldn't. Number one, I can't. And number two, I can go hire somebody with 20 years of experience that's done that thing and they're going to teach me the best practices and they know all the pitfalls and they know all the mistakes and they know all that stuff. And you know what? I'm not good at that and I don't want to be good at that. And I'm a hundred and I respect the people that are good at that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, that's kind of the shift that I've gone through uh, over time. That's really allowed me to scale the business uh, at the end of the day. I remember back when I was a, uh, you know, a, a beginning entrepreneur and before I made any real strong, strong hires, you know, I just didn't even believe that somebody of that caliber was hireable, mm -hmm. right? Some of the, some of the leaders I have inside of the organization now, I was like, well, why wouldn't they just be entrepreneurs, right? Why, why wouldn't they just start, if they're that good, why wouldn't they start their own company? And, you know, really what it comes down to is, you know, they're really good at a thing, right? They're, they're not good at, uh, you know, that is, um, being an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur for me is the, the most important thing is you got to have balls of steel, right? Like you, the risk factor that's involved in, you know, carrying, I, you know, I think our overhead currently is about $600,000 a month. I say, you know, I, w I wake up, you know, every morning and it's like, okay, we're whatever, $15,000 in the hole or what, you know, $17,000 in the hole. And we got to work our way out of this hole. Before a breakfast. <laughs> Like, What's that? Before breakfast, you're 17 yeah, right? in a hole. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, carrying that burden, carrying that risk as the CEO and as the entrepreneur, um, I find a, with a lot of my people, they don't, they don't have the overall vision mm. of what is going to be built and where we're going to be in five years. And it's amazing to me, you know, I, I have a real passion for just understanding how stuff works, a uh, curiosity. So I, I'll dig into pretty much anything is, uh, you know, I can get passionate about for a period of time and just how all uh, the generalist of how, you know, understanding how all those things can potentially work together and, and seeing the opportunity and, you know, being able to be, uh, you know, two years down the road, here's what we're going to need. And here's how this is going to work. And here, you know, I, here's the pitfalls we're going to run into. And here's how we're going to avoid them. Um, you know, for something that's never been built before. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a lot of those great people, they don't they don't have that capability. They, they know how to do the thing that they know how to do really, really well. And they know how to build what they've built in the past, but their ability to abstract out and then create something totally new and different using a lot of the systems and stuff that they've built before sometimes is, is not as strong as it should be. So you've got kind of that combination of risk and that combination of vision that really makes the, the entrepreneur great. 
and you have to have like it, it, to to get someone you know to of that caliber to join you you have to have a great vision because they, they they probably they probably have some vision if they're a great person they have some, they have their own vision oh, of course. they have their things they want to do but if you can sort of in you know indoctrinate them to your vision and get them super excited about it that's right. really the key so you have to have that strong vision yourself exactly to bring these exactly. people on board you know right. is it a of where the where the overall opportunity lies, what some of the initial steps to get going, some of the initial steps for validation, and uh, you know, getting getting them to see, you know, communication is such a key piece because you know a lot of the times as an entrepreneur, especially as a solopreneur, we've got everything in our head and we know everything, but a lot of times it doesn't come out of our mouth and it, you know, all of a sudden we have a team and it's like everything's in here and then it's like how do you get that message out? And how do you get people to buy in? And how do you, you know, even to this day, at, at some point, they're like, you never told us this. And I'm like, well, I've been thinking about this for three months, right? So, you know, as, as the leader, uh, manager, entrepreneur, it's like, how do I get that communication out? Because the clearer everybody else becomes on your vision, the more that they can start being insightful into some of Rather than just doing tasks, they can be insightful for what you want to create and actually add value. And you know, we really pride ourselves as an organization that we like to hire smart people, we like to hire innovative people, we like to hire uh, humble people, no egos here, um, and and we want to empower them to you know impact and and make the overall organization great. And and I think we've we've done a good job of that. Nice. So. You talked. This is just a, a quick question about about the billion dollar business. Is you know you talked about when you're in your 30s, you want what the person in their 40s has, and, and on and on and on. And I feel that as well. So when it comes to having a hundred million dollar business, or you know, and, and you wanting to get to a billion, is is it for personal lifestyle ramifications, or is it really just that next thing? It's that next big landmark. Once you've achieved something, you just you know, humans aren't happy when they achieve something. They're happy when they pursue something. Right. Uh, quite. Is, is that what you find? Is it sort of like going to be an, it's, it's like once, if you have a billion dollar business, are you going to be like, yeah, now I can spend 200 days a year traveling or nope. is it really just about the win? Yes. It's about, it's about the struggle, right? Because what I believe is happiness comes from growth as a human, right? Happiness becomes, you know, Hey, I did this challenge and then I overcame it. And then I, I, I iterated and iterated and iterated and then I made it work. And now I feel good, right? Like at least for me, this is yeah. how it works. And, and I believe this is a lot of employees as well. Like they're seeing themselves grow them, seeing themselves become a better person, uh, from a technical perspective or a cultural perspective or a management perspective or a skill set perspective. They just feel like people like to progress and they, and they like to grow. And I know this about myself as well. So, you know, I get really, really bored very, very easy. As soon as I figure something out and I've done it two or three times, I know I have to pass it off to somebody else if I want it to keep happening because I will no, no longer do it. So, what drives me is harder and oh, harder and harder challenges. I mean, you look at a guy like Elon Musk and he's like, he keeps looking for harder things. That, All right, let me build a hyperloop. Let me go to the moon yep. because those are really hard things, right? He's like, okay, I already built a car company, you know, and I'll, I'll grow it and it'll continue to go on. But now I'm going to stock it full of great people. And I'm going to give it direction and vision. Uh, I'm going to, you know, make sure we're on course for what we want to accomplish, but I, I'm good. Right. Like that, that thing is going. So now I need to go, go to Mars, yep. right. Or, or something else. Build a because wizard hat is apparently how do one of his grow? things. <laughs> What's that? He's building a wizard hat. He's building like a, if you've ever seen X-Men, he's trying to build Cerebro, a way yeah. that humans can like amplify their consciousness by a hundred fold. Just right, like because it's inner because space, it's, outer space. He has no limits. It's pretty amazing. Right. It seems hard, right. It seems really yeah. hard and really unachievable, uh, you know, or just outside his realm of possibility. Yeah. And really that's, that's what, you know, moves me is that, so that billion, multi-billion dollar company is just outside my realm of possibility. I can see a pretty clear vision on how to get there. Um, you know, there's a lot I don't know, and there's a lot I'm going to have to learn through that process. And that learning and that growth is, is going to make me feel fulfilled as, as a human being. It, it really, I think at some point in your life, you, you've got enough money. Uh, in my case, I've got enough assets that make me enough money that I'm good, 
right? Like I, I don't have to, not I have enough money in the bank. I have enough cash flow coming in from the assets that I've created that I'm good for the rest of my life. I literally never have to, to work another day in my life. And those assets will continue to appreciate. So the overall number will continue to grow over time. So when you no longer have to work, what do you do? Right. And for me, you know, for me, it's the challenge of, okay, well, let's go build something big. And, you know, I'll probably grow a for D to and do a multi-billion dollar exit at some points. And then the next step will be like build a PE firm and then start doing, you know, taking over companies and then doing turnarounds yep. like that sounds super interesting Berkshire to me. Berkshire Hathaway. What's that? Like Berkshire Hathaway, like, yeah. uh, you know, Warren Buffett does the same thing. Or just finding, you know, assets that we could acquire for $200 million, you know, get a PE firm, uh, you know, kind of be the turnaround captain to go into those companies, build, take my management team, turn those companies around and, you know, 10, 20 times that money out of that company at some point. You know, the the, the challenges will continue to to grow and get bigger um, and and. Really, that's what's fulfilling. It's it's not about a, a car or a yacht or n- none of that stuff matters at some point. Um, there's also another big side of me is I want to start a nonprofit foundation that uh, incubates entrepreneurs. I, I, I just have a passion for coaching people and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I'd love to, you know, take billions of dollars and invest it into entrepreneurs in our country you know, uh, education and coaching and mentoring programs. And, you know, again, back to that legacy thing, you know, uh, you know, the Jason active foundation and, you know, how many people can we impact in the world and how many people can, can we change their lives and how do we make, uh, the world a better place, uh, not out of greed, but truly out of, out of giving and caring and, and, and nurturing individuals. Amazing. This, yeah, this, this just idea of, of thinking big, uh, one of my favorite thinkers these days is a guy named Jordan Peterson, who, who does these, these talks on YouTube and he's, he's gaining a really big following. And his big thing is all about the sort of like, if you want to live a good life, if you want to be happy in life, look around for something heavy and pick it up and carry it and, you know, move it forward. And, right. uh, and that's what I hear echoed in what you're saying too, is that people that are, you know, you're not going to be happy hitting the snooze button for your whole life, or you're not going to be happy. Uh, even, well, it depends on the person too. Pe- people are different, but at the same time, uh, that idea of, of finding a challenge and, and tackling it as a way to really insulate yourself against the suffering in life, uh, yeah. that, that you're sort of inevitable to come is, is I think such a, such a great idea. And it's something that you're embodying pretty fully. Yes. So I, I love it. So talk, I just want to, I have to, we have to run here. We got to wrap this up in the next sort of five, six minutes. Talk sure. a little bit about your adventures, about some of these adventures that you've had. I know you just came from the salt flats of Bolivia where you were yep. trying to break a land speed record. Yep. That's pretty uh, so, exciting. So I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My dad uh, was the motorcycle mechanic for the number one racer from BSA back in the 70s. Uh, and then he built a motorcycle uh, tool and part company that he sold. That, and then he got into airplanes. He loved airplanes. So he started building aircraft electronics. And then back about 15 years ago, he went out to the Bonneville Salt Flats and was uh, was like, hey, these guys aren't going that fast, and <laughs> the equipment that they're building and engineering and designing is not that good. So he decided about 15 years ago to go build his own what it's called a motorcycle streamliner. Uh, it's called the Ack Attack, A-C-K Attack dot com. If you want, or A-C-K Attack, just Google it. Talk about legacy. Um, so they they have the current record at 376 miles an hour average speed. The fastest they've gone clocked is uh, 397. But in order to get a record, you've got to go two directions within a uh, two hour turnaround. Okay. Uh, and they did, and it's the average time of, of all of them. Um, to account for so, wind or something, I guess, right? Yeah, wind can impact it. I mean, so much. It, it's really a technical challenge more than anything because you know things aren't. There's not a lot of information on stuff that goes 350 to 500 miles an hour. Um, you know, there's only a handful of people in the world that have gone that that fast in wheel-driven vehicles on the on the land. Um, so Bonneville, uh, this this piece of equipment, this motorcycle takes uh, it's got a run up, and to get the record, it, it doesn't matter how long the course is. 
uh, Bonneville because they've been mining it. Bonneville's on the border of Utah and Nevada. It's it's uh, Bonneville Salt Flats is where most of the land speed records have been set. They've been mining it over the last whatever 40, 50 years. They've taken all the potash out of it. There's not much salt left. So they can only get like 11 miles. It's bumpy and it's not much salt. Mm. So we actually went to Bolivia because of Bolivia, uh, there is a salt lake called Uyuni. Uh, it's about a one hour flight from La Paz. And it's at 12,000 feet at the top of the mountain. And it's got about three feet of salt. And it's 100 miles long by like 50 miles wide. So wow. they built a 15-mile long course. Um, and there was all kinds of weird stuff that happened when you when you get that high of elevation. Because Bonneville's at 4,000 feet. Uni's at 12,000 feet. The air is much, much thinner, which is great because there's not that much resistance mm -hmm. as the bike goes through the air. Um, but at the same time, all all kinds of other problems started showing up. Uh, we run 30 pounds of boost with two Hayabusa motors connected together. And the boost into the motors, or actually to the intercooler, kept bursting the hoses because there's not enough outside pressure to hold uh, the, the rubberized um, uh, tube connectors together. So, you know, we'd make a run and it takes about two hours to make a run because you got to go down, you got to prep the bike, you got to clear the course, you got to do all this stuff. So, um, you know, in, in this stuff, my dad's always like, oh yeah, I'm done. We've got the record. We didn't get 400, but you know how it goes. It's, he's like, well, you know, maybe we'll go back next year. So still, still, you know, has that fire inside of him. I he can does see you come ride. by it honestly. You come by it honestly. And to be able to take a trip like this with your dad and it seems one of the things that I'm that I'm getting into in my, in my you know so far is this idea of peak experiences. It's one yes. of the reasons that why we do the things that we do, so that we can put ourselves in these situations where we can have peak experiences, whether that be right. traveling or cuisine or or whatever. And I feel like peak experiences are are a kind of a a, fun, a good thing to strive for these days. And that sounds that's like a pretty incredible of, peak experience. That was kind of you know. Uh... So like I was saying, at 20, you want things, right? You want the watches and the cars. And in your 30s, you start to think about family and uh, stability and stuff like that. And in your 40s, you think about th uh, experiences. Mm. It's all about experiences and, you know, traveling and stuff like that. I'm actually headed to Ibiza on Wednesday. We've got an 80-foot yacht that we're renting there, me and a few friends. And we're just going to cruise around, go to Formentera and the beach clubs and stuff like that. Um, I was obviously in Berlin. I went to London for four days after that. We were at Montreal for the F1 races. We had a box on the finish line, a private box, right? So it's just about, you know, making sure, you know, I think a lot of people get caught up in, oh, I got to work all the time. I've got so much to do. And I, it's, it's important as entrepreneurs, you know, it's in the first few years, it's fine, right? Like get, dig in, don't, no, no, no vacations, just get all this stuff figured out. But at some point you've got to say enough's enough and you got to prioritize, you know, things like travel, time with your family, all that kind of stuff. Uh, because there's always more opportunity. There's always more money to be made. There's always tons of stuff to do. There's all that will always exist and it will never go away. So make sure you book your personal time first. Well, you've got to remind yourself of why you're doing this. You know what I mean? Like you've got to refresh. For a, just taking taking time away from the business. Everyone knows, or even just of a, of a task you might be working on can really refresh your perspective on it and help you help you tackle it in the long long run. But if you yeah, you refresh that passion, remind yourself why you're doing this. I think that's only going to be a good thing in the in the long run for your business. The other the other cool thing is when you've got a system and and a company and operations. If you're here micro, making micro changes all day, constantly, uh, you don't know how well the system's working. So it's really good to go away and see what happens and what breaks while you're gone. Mm. Then come back and say, okay, these are a couple of things I need to work on because the system's broken here. Right? Gotcha. Um, and you can only do that when you go away and you can't even, it's not like three days of going away. You need to go away for a couple of weeks and you need to see where everybody struggles and where everybody has a hard time without you there. Then you need to work on the operations and work on the innovation on those on those specific areas. Interesting. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, the Robust Marketer. Uh, people can um, still buy the live recording from the event. We we have uh, on iStackTraining.com. We have the the full recordings of Jason's full talk plus everyone else's. So you can go there and check that out. But also check out Jason's blog, which is jasonakatif.com. Uh, where you can just get his slides and some some of his footage by engaging with his recently created messenger bot. Um, 
Uh, also, I mean, of course, if you're an affiliate and you want uh, kind of gray hat, white hat campaigns, you're not running cloaking or stuff like that, pay for D. We've got probably about a thousand campaigns that you can run on Facebook and Google without having to cloak and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, still actively looking for affiliates and would love to work with people that are more long term in their mindset and want to build uh, affiliate businesses that, uh, you know, aren't trying to scam people. Nice. Okay. Well, that sounds fantastic. Jason, we should talk again soon. I think there's some other things that we're sure. going to discuss, but uh, for now, I got to run to lunch. Uh, okay. Thanks again. And we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Eric. Okay. Bye.